So can everybody hear us? Yes. All right. So as you know, Brian and I did four little AU events in the fall about Concord, which is the town where I work. And Karen and Mark asked us if we do a few more. And so um, because it was History Corner, Karen suggested and it's a great idea doing some presidents. Um, and th this is what Brian and I have been reading about. So we're basically just going to tell you what we've been reading about. But before we start, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. So today is a really big day. We had our election back in November. And then in December, this special voting piece called the Electoral College certified the election. And then today, today is the day that Congress is just opening the envelopes and recording the vote. So this is the final step. And then in two weeks from now, we'll, we'll, um, we'll inaugurate the next president. So our questions are, number one, raise your hand if you know, number one, who is going to be inaugurated in two weeks? Dan? I'd say Biden. Yes. Good job. All right, trickier question. What number president is Biden? Does anybody know what number president Biden is gonna be? Chris. He's can you unmute? Number one. No, well, he, in some people's eyes, he's gonna be number one, but in the long line of presidents, who, what number president? Our country has had how many presidents now? Does anybody know? Sanaz, do you know? What number? I think, well, from the year that Abraham Lincoln was until Bo President Bush and then on um, to um, George Washington and then uh, You've got look a, lot at a of number, them, but what number all together? You've got a lot of them, Joseph. 47. You're so close. It's 46. 46. You are so close. It's 46. Good. Okay. And then, um, oh, I don't know if this might be hard. Does anybody know his home state? What state he's from? Adam. Um, I know his home state, which is the Mass Massachusetts. No, I'll give you a hint, Adam. Yeah. It starts with a D. It starts oh. with a D. Uh, I think it's in Dedham. No, good guess. Anybody else? Ned? It's a D. It's Delaware. Bingo. Bingo. Ah. All right. Now, a couple more questions, and then we'll go. We'll start talking about um, the president we're going to talk about. But this is big news. Biden's vice president. Who is Biden's vice president? Kamala Harris. Who yelled that out? You had it right. Who had Dan O'Donnell. Dan O'Donnell. Okay, and she she is historic in three ways. Well, probably more than that, but three mm -hmm. ways that we've been talking about a lot. What are, what are the three reasons that she's historic as a vice president? Jennifer. She's the first woman vice president. <laughs> hey, yes, yes. What's another reason? What else? Why else is she historic? Does somebody else have another reason? She's Indian and Korean. Uh, uh, Chris? Uh, 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 she, she'll probably be, uh, in, in four years later, she'll probably be, she'll probably be a, a, a president. She might be. She might be. Does anybody know two other reasons about her being a historic vice president, though? Ned? Ned, you got to unmute. unmute. You're mute. You're, un you're muted, Ned. The very first Black female oh. vice president. Absolutely, Ned. She's a woman, she's African American, and she's also half um, Asian American. She was born, her, her mother was born in India. So she's a first in a lot of, a lot of ways. So we're, Ryan and I are really excited about today and we're really looking forward to inauguration in two weeks. All right, but 
when yeah. Karen asked us to do presidents, Brian and I were thinking, okay, Karen said four weeks. And we thought, how out of 46 presidents, can we pick four presidents? Which ones, how are we gonna pick? So we looked at the list and it just so happens that four presidents were born in Massachusetts. So we are gonna talk about the four presidents who were born in Massachusetts. And today we're gonna start with one that you all know um, and his name is John Adams. So Karen, if you wouldn't mind starting, can you start at the PowerPoint? Sure. Do you, are you going to advance it or am I? I do I just tell I, you? I, I advance it if I'm okay. sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk, but then at the end, or, you know, we'll stop at a couple of places where people can ask questions. Okay, so we, Brian and I started this on Sunday in, in that we went and we took pictures. So this is very, this is Brian, this is one of his masks. And I don't know, you have, if you have really good eyes, you can see what his mask is. The, the little circled part of his mask is Hamilton. This is from the Hamilton show and Brian's a Hamilton nut. And he felt that he really should wear that. He felt he should wear that um, face mask when we go looking at the home of a founding father. Where did it go? There, oh, it, there is. it is. There okay. it is. Okay, so that's, I just wanted to show. So Brian and I were driving around while he had his Hamilton mask on. Okay, next one, Karen. So this, you can see Brian in this. And this is interesting. This is where, mm. oh, Sorry. it went away again. I know, I don't know why. Oops, that's really, you don't want that. Mm -hmm. That's my father. <laughs> <laughs> From many, many years ago, where the heck did it go? Sorry. That's okay. All right. There he um, is. Karen, I, 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 I was trying to, uh, yeah. click I was start trying to make slideshow. It Brian's saying, asking what happens if you say click start, start slideshow. Up I, above can't, the, I can't find it. It's above, it's up the, here, uh, above the right corner. Right oh, corner. here. Okay. That's, that's what Brian says you should click. And I think Brian, Bob, you're a genius. There we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, okay. So now we're going to go to the next slide. And this is, we, this was, this was helpful for us because this is close by. This is in Quincy. And I'm sure some of you have been in Quincy, but if you look at the top picture in the middle, you see that these two houses are very close together. And then we took a bunch of pictures of them, but this is where John Adams was born. And two things about it are funny. He was born here on October 19th. 1735, but then they changed the calendar. They changed the way the calendar works. So it changed his birthday. So his birthday is also recorded as October 30th. Imagine having your birthday changed, but that was one thing. But the other thing is this house was where he was born was in Braintree. And for many years, he had this home in Braintree. He grew up here. And then as an adult, he would come here. And then they changed the name of the city. They changed the lines of the city. So now this is actually in Quincy. Um, so both the date and the place changed. But, um, and also another big difference, you see the streets here, it's really on a busy street corner. But when he was born here, it was surrounded by lots and lots of um, property because his father was a farmer. His father, also named John, was a farmer, and he also made boots. And Brian, what was his last job? He was a deacon in his church. He was a deacon in his church. Brian likes to say that, because Brian's a deacon in our church. And, um, and then he was child number one, and then he had two more brothers, Peter and Elihu. Um, but his dad would look at John and say, no, you're going to go to college. I, you're a bright kid. I want you to go to college. I don't want to be a farmer. I don't want you to be a farmer. And so John um, went to school. He actually taught, he learned to read and write before he went to school. And then he went to some neighborhood schools. And then he taught himself Latin. There was a grammar book and he learned the whole book of Latin. And then he wanted to go to Boston Latin in the town of Boston, but he had to know math. So he, in one year, he taught himself all the math that he needed to know to go there. And then he went to Boston Latin. He would go into Boston and that school you had to pay for. So that was a little hard for his family, but they thought it was important. And then he, they decided to send him to Harvard and Harvard was you know, one of the few universities around. It was the big college in town. It was, uh, um, and a lot of young men went there to become ministers. So his dad, but, but you had to take the entrance exam 
and the entrance exam was reading and writing in Latin and Greek. Um, but he passed and he got into Harvard. He had 26 classmates and four years later he graduated, but he had decided that he did not want to be a minister, but he loved to read, he loved to write, he loved to argue. Um, and so his first job out of Harvard was he became a teacher in Worcester. But then the last thing I think we'll say about this slide, I think is that when he was in Worcester, he decided that a good job for him, if he liked to read and write and argue, he thought he might like to be a lawyer. So um, there was no such thing as law school in those days. You would just study law books and you would find a lawyer who was already a lawyer who would teach you and give you ideas about what you should read and what you should know. Um, so he, he studied and studied and then he took a test which you have to take to become a lawyer called the bar exam. And he passed the bar exam and he moved back to Braintree. He moved back to these houses um, to become a lawyer and to open a law practice in Braintree. And oh, and I guess one other thing I should tell you is that while when he moved back to Braintree, he met a young woman named Abigail Smith. And Abigail Smith was nine years younger than he was. So she was a teenager. Um, he was a young man in his 20s, but she loved books too. She was a minister's daughter and they wrote letters. They wrote so many letters back and forth for five years. They started letter writing practice that they did all their lives. And then um, just before she turned 20 and just before he turned 29, they got married and she became Abigail Adams. So Bri, is there anything I forgot that you want to say about these pictures? No. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Oh. oh, so Brian and I thought this would be a good way to tell you some things. But here are some dates on the left side. You see the 1765 up to 1776. And then the next column tells you what was going on in their family life. So Abigail and John, you see their pictures here when they're older, but they had five children. Their first daughter was named Abigail, but of course that was the mother's name. So they gave her the nickname Nabby. And then John Quincy Adams was born. And then they had another daughter named Susanna, but sadly she died just a year later. A lot of children died in those days before they had vaccinations and things like that. Then they had another son, Charles, and then they had another son, Thomas. So they had five children and only four of them lived past childhood. But if you look at the next column, this is kind of where we get into John Adams and, and politics, but there had just been a big war that ended. It was called the French and Indian War and England came over and fought the French and fought some Native Americans defending the land for the colonists. And now the war was over and England had, had won, um, but England was now saying to the colonists, wow, that was really expensive. We need you to help us pay for that now. We came here and we were defending you and now we need you to help us pay. And the colonists said, ah, you know, we, we don't like you bossing us around. And so England had all these acts. So they were trying to raise money. So the first thing they did, I didn't put it on here, but in 1764, England said, every time you have a gallon of molasses, you have to pay us three cents. Mm -hmm. And colonists used molasses for everything. It was like sugar. It was a sweetener. So they hated that. And then England said in 1765, the Stamp Act. You know, every time you buy anything that's a piece of paper, a stamp, a card, a book, stationery, you have to pay us tax on that. And colonists didn't like that. And then the next one going down, you see the Quartering Act. And England said, we are sending so many soldiers to you. And, um, and they, they're over in your country and they're protecting you and they don't have a place to stay. So whether you like it or not, you have to have a soldier in your house. We're gonna send a soldier to your house. You have to give them one of your bedrooms. You have to feed them. And that's the quartering act. And colonists said, are you kidding? We, we have to put up soldiers in our house? And then the Townsend Act, which was more of the same. And then this one we'll get back to, but the Tea Act, and this was really a problem. They, they taxed all the tea and um, that was the favorite beverage of, of uh, colonists. The way so many people drink coffee now, the colonists drank tea that way. And then there were more acts that were, there were just so many taxes that the colonists said they were intolerable. They were, they just couldn't stand them. They couldn't tolerate them. And so then you have your last column and there are a bunch of things that happened. But in reaction to having all those soldiers in Boston, everywhere you looked, you saw British soldiers and they had red coats on all the time. So they were really obvious. And what did they call them, Bri? Yeah, 
red coats or what was the nickname? Lobsterbacks. Lobsterbacks. The the colonists <laughs> would call them lobsterbacks. They thought they looked like <clears throat> lobsters, and and they just <clears throat> it just got people so mad. And so in December in sixteenth. <laughs> December 16th, in uh, 1770, they were, there were some um, British soldiers standing guard outside the um, old state house. And then some men, some colonists, men and boys came around and they were taunting them and teasing them and throwing snowballs at them. And it just escalated and the crowd grew bigger. And then somebody said fire and the soldiers fired and five colonists were killed. And, but a massacre, the word massacre suggests that it's a really big and it, like a slaughter of a lot of people, but the colonists used the word massacre because that's the way they felt. But Karen, if you go to the next slide, I wanna just show you a picture. We showed you this picture in the fall when we were talking about Paul Revere because Paul Revere drew this picture and then he sent it around, he made lots of copies of it and he sent it around because he was trying to influence the people. And if you look at this slide, it looks like, I mean, who does it look like is, is the aggressive person in this slide, the British or the colonists? Does it, it, it looks like the, the British, right? It looks like they're the ones who are firing. It looks like the colonists are, are just on the ground and they're bloody. There's that little dog in the front, which makes you feel like it, you know, sympathetic for the colonists. And so Paul Revere um, circulated this around and, and really a lot of colonists were angry. And this said, that's the final straw. We're so angry right now. But the reason Brian and I are telling you about this in um, our talk about John Adams is what, Brian? He represented the British officers. John Adams, court. yeah, John Adams liked an argument and he was a good lawyer and he wanted, you know, he and he did believe in the law. And so the law, he, he defended, he defended the British soldiers. And he really annoyed a lot of his colonial friends and a lot of his colonial neighbors. By and this- Even his fiery cousin, who we're going to talk about more about his, him. His fiery cousin, Sam, who was one of the biggest protesters and Sam was furious at him. But John Adams thought that they deserved, that the British soldiers deserved a good lawyer. So he represented them and he won. He won on behalf of the lawyers. And so that was really hard. And his friends, he, he had been living in Boston with his family at this time doing some legal work, but he, his friends were so annoyed at him that he moved back to, uh, he moved back to Braintree for a while because um, he, he really had angered a lot of the patriots. I think, wow. I think. That's sorry, I left. Sorry, I kind of left. I had to go to the bathroom. I'm sorry, I left. Well, thanks for coming back. And, and when you have a piece like this, the word, the big word that you use when you're trying to convince somebody and you tell a story in a certain way, or you, you draw a picture in a certain way to influence people, it's called propaganda. So this was clearly some early propaganda. Yeah, right. Next slide, Karen. Oh, I you want you know me to what, go Karen? Actually, back? Karen, can you go back? Yeah, can you go back? Yeah. So the other thing, if you're in the last column with the T Act, we were going to talk about that. And the colonists really were angry about the T Act. As I said, they love tea. So you know this story, probably. You read it and heard this story before. But in the middle of one night, um, how many men was it, Brian? Anywhere, somewhere between 30 and 130 men uh, dressed up, some of them dressed up like Native Americans, trying to fool people about who was doing this. And they climbed on three ships that had come from England and they dumped 342 huge crates of tea right into the ocean, right into Boston Harbor. And so that was just vandalism and that was destruction of property. And England got so mad because so much money had been wasted and their property had been vandalized that they shut down Boston Harbor. And they just said, that's it. We're punishing you city of Boston. We're not letting any ships come in. We're not letting ships go out. You can't import any goods. You can't export any goods. And so that was a really tough time. And we were one of 13 colonies. And at this time, Sam Adams said, you know what, we need to talk to the other colonies. We need to tell them what might happen. We need to tell them what happened to us. We need to start working together. And so they formed what was called the First Continental Congress. And that's here because John Adams was one of the men who was asked to go to the First Continental Congress, which was in Philadelphia. Along and with Sam. Along with Sam Adams, along with John Hancock, lots of names that you know. And so they had to go by horseback. 
stagecoach and horseback. It's, it's over. It's where Maggie and Joel live. It's 325 miles away. So um, that was a long ride. And so he went down and he was there for a long time. And they were talking about how to deal with this. And finally, when they had some, some ideas and some plans, then he came home. But when he came home, then there was the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which we talked about in the fall. And that's the first time that there were actual um, gunshots fired. And after that, a lot of the colonists, and remember all 13 colonies were talking to each other now, and they said, this, this, it's really gonna be war now. They, they shot, they fired guns, so it's gotta be war now. So Sam <coughs> Adams went back to Philadelphia for the second Continental Congress. And this time- um, We have a slide of that. I know, oh, what? Okay, well, yeah, we'll go there. So that time he was gone for a really long time. So Brian says I should advance a couple of slides. Karen. Okay. okay, the one, oh, oh, this is, so during this time, okay, I see what Brian is telling me. So during this time, this is a map of what Boston looked like at the time. And it's funny because there's water almost all the way around it. And we filled in, now they filled in a lot of this water. So it's, there isn't so much water, but, um, but down at the bottom, that's Braintree. And that's where Abigail, because every time John left, Abigail was left running a farm by herself and raising her four children. And so um, she lived down here and her son, John Quincy was probably about 10 years old now. And they would stand on a hill all the way down here in Braintree and they could see what was going on in Boston if there was fighting, if the soldiers were firing or then when there was the Battle of Bunker Hill, um, there was lots of gunshot and they could see it in the sky. Just, it was almost like watching fireworks except for it was real. And Abigail and John continued their, um, they wrote letters again and again and again to each other and uh, she was lucky because not all women knew how to write, not all women had had a good education, but she and John wrote so many letters to each other. And during this time, when he was in the Continental Congress, her letters would tell him what was going on in Boston and what was happening politically. So John appreciated that information, but so did the Continental Congress. They would share that information with the Continental Congress as well. Next uh, slide. Okay. <laughs> Brian says we can go on. And so here's a map of colonial America. And I, I put the places where John Adams would be. And so up here in Boston and Braintree, that's where he spent a lot of his time. But if you look at the third arrow down, that's Philadelphia. And he started to spend a lot of time there. As I say, it's 325 miles, 350 miles away. So he and Abigail were separated for a long time. She was raising the kids by herself doing all the farm work and writing to him and keeping him informed. And then we'll talk later, he did get to New York City, Washington, DC, but that comes later. Yeah. What, what? Brian says you can switch. Okay, so when he was down at the Continental Congress the second time, they decided, we're, that's it, we're done with England. They, you know, they've shot at us, we've had so many problems with them. We are gonna break away from them we're, and we're gonna be our own country. We're not gonna be states anymore. We're, we're not gonna be colonies anymore. We're gonna be states. And then they said, but before we do that, we have to, it's, they kind of had to write a breakup letter. They wanted to write to England and to tell them why they were breaking up with them, why, what, they, what the problem was. And so they, they said, you know, we all think that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, which he did, but there was a committee that talked about the ideas and things that should go into it. And you can see the committee here, John Adams, that's why we're mentioning it now from Massachusetts and Robert Livingston <coughs> from New York and Roger Sherman from Connecticut and Ben Franklin, you've all heard of him from Pennsylvania and Thomas Jefferson from Virginia. And in the top picture, you see all five of them, but in the bottom, you see Ben Franklin and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Of course, he was famous for his beautiful red hair. Um, but. But when they were talking about who should write it, there's a very, Brian loves the musical 1776. And there's a very funny song about who should write it out of the five men. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson was really a gifted writer. So that's why he ended up writing it. But he did say to John Adams, you know, you like to write too, you, sh you should write it. You, you love arguing, you like to write. And John Adams said, you know what? I'm, I'm too obnoxious. People don't like me. You know, they, they and it, it was kind of true. He was kind of a little bit of a know-it-all and he was very vain. And when he wrote things, he liked to fill whatever he wrote with all, everything he knew. When his wife would read his court, um, 
his things that he wrote for court sometimes, she'd say, you know, you don't have to show off so much. You don't have to use every big word, you know. You don't have to put every piece of Le Roman history that you know in there. So he knew, he knew he was a little disliked and a little obnoxious. Um, so he asked Thomas Jefferson to write it. But the other thing that I think is interesting, I, and this is important to me, but when he was writing it, of course, he was writing back and forth to Abigail and telling her that they were working on this and they were trying to get the writing just right. And she said, I think the Declaration of Independence should do away with slavery. That was, she felt that very strongly. And he said, well, that's interesting that you say that because we're talking about putting it in the Declaration, but we think if we put it in the Declaration, the Southern states won't vote for this and we need the Southern support. So they took that out. But then she said, um, here's her quote. She said, also in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies. She wanted him to remember the ladies. <coughs> she wanted women to be as independent as men because before this, the only people who could vote were white men who happened to own property. And she just didn't think that was fair at all. She thought women should have a vo voice. And certainly in her relationship with her husband, she knew, you know, she was very well versed in politics and what was going on. And, and so she would like to vote. But when she wrote this to her husband, you can see his um, response right back here. He wrote back to her and he said, Abigail, I cannot but laugh at what you tell me to do. So he did not remember the ladies. Right. I have a hat, I have a hat, a baseball hat that says, remember the ladies that we got down at the Adams house many years ago. I wish I'd brought it out, but I forgot. <laughs> I <didn't. laughs> so anyway, there we are. But the Declaration of Independence, as you know, was finally signed on um, July 4th, 1776. And even though John Adams didn't write it, what he did do is then they had to convince all the men at the Continental Congress, there were 56 men from 13 states, something like that, from 13 colonies, he had to convince them all to sign it. And that's where he was very helpful, very instrumental, arguing and debating and convincing people to sign it. And they did. And it was signed on July 4th. Um, but the other thing is, there was no TV, there was no radio, there wasn't texting or email or, or the internet. So even though they signed this in Philadelphia on July 4th, the actual Declaration of Independence did not come back to Boston until two weeks later. And somebody stood on the balcony of the State House and read it out loud so that the people of Boston could hear what it said. Next slide. <clears throat> <clears throat> Can I say something, something quick? Oh, sure. I, I need to take my, <clears throat> my voice anyway. Who's um, talking? Sure. Hi, Sonia. It's me, Hi, Julie. I, um, I wanted to say that I do remember all these people and um, um, the, the, where, the, where you, you were talking about the, um, the colonists and the Boston Harbor, um, that was where, I mean, I did write in the chat, but that was where they did the tea, the tea party. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, um, and Sanaz, do you remember when we were talking about this in the fall, when we were talking about Paul Revere and I was showing you some things from the Concord yeah. Museum? The Concord Museum actually has a bottle of the tea that was in the harbor. Somebody some farmer back in the day realized that might be a, um, a memory for people to keep. So he scooped a lot of the tea out of the harbor and put it in little bottles. And, and there is one at the Concord Museum, which we've seen. So somebody thought to save some of that as a, as a souvenir or a memento of that, that amazing day. But you're right, it was in the harbor. And also that when you said about the, the declaration and uh, the, um the for the woman being independent and all that mm -hmm. i do remember that the very first president that was doing uh um, was saying that the freedom and the i mean they were not free was uh abraham lincoln that mm -hmm. did that and that the way that you were saying that the declaration was being against yeah. to Abraham Lincoln. 
Yeah, you mentioned uh, it before, Sanaz, too. Of the conflict, the, the, the colonists, the British, and Russia, and Egypt, and France had with the colonists. And, yeah, and, uh, you know, yeah. Sanaz, you mentioned Abraham Lincoln before, and I was saying that Abigail Adams and some other people wanted to do away with slavery. And these early founders said, no, we can't afford to do that right now. We, 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 we'd never get agreement. So they didn't do it. And the early presidents didn't do it. And the, it didn't happen until Abraham Lincoln. And he was almost 100 years later. He was 90 years later. He was president number 16. It yeah. took them 16 presidents till they got to that, which sure. isn't, you know, they should have done it sooner, a lot sooner. But you're right. Exactly. You're right to bring that up. And yeah. it was before that they shoot they shot him on the back of his head when he became blind mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yep karen can you go back a slide i'm realizing i forgot something sure no, we have a long outside, brian's telling me to hurry up um but when the war was going on so this declared was the official declaration of war and then but the problem was this Continental Congress now had a lot of things that they needed to do. Now that they said they wanted to be free, now they had to fight, but they didn't have an army. So they had to raise an army and they had to come up with a way to pay army members and they had to come up with uniforms and they had to come up with weapons and they needed money. They're, each state had its own kind of money and they need to invent a, a kind of money that would work in all the new states. And they needed a commander for the army. And so Brian? It was George Boston. But it was Adams who first proposed, who first proposed it. Yeah, Adams proposed and everybody agreed that George Washington would be the obvious leader to lead the army. Um, so that they had a lot going on. They had a lot that they had to do. But John Adams' job now, because he was such a good talker and because he liked to argue, um, we, we couldn't win this war by ourselves. And they knew that. We needed some army strength and naval strength, Navy, and we needed money. So they sent, um, they sent John Adams over to France. They put him on a boat. It took six weeks to cross the, the ocean. And he was in France and he was talking to the French court. So was Ben Franklin. And they were just trying to convince the French court to support us and to lend us money and to let um, lend us some of their skilled military people. And uh, they were successful. It was funny because a lot of people thought John Adams was cranky and vain and people over there loved Ben Franklin. He was fun. He was flirtatious with the women. He was easygoing. Um, but together they were able to convince France to, to, um, to send them the money that they needed. And probably the most famous French officer that you know, Brian. The Marquis de Lafayette. The Marquis de Lafayette. So we definitely, so they were successful in getting us some help from France. Okay, so thank you, Karen. All Excuse right. me, Julia, you have something to say? Is that Ned? It is. Hey, yes. Ned. I, speaking about the Declaration of Independence, one of the people who signed that declaration was my family. I remember you telling me that. I remember. I forget what the name was. Do you remember what the name was? It was Uncle, uh, uh, nephew. Uh, I, uh, my great uncle, my and one of the public figures who was the, the, the governor of the state of, of New Hampshire. Yeah, and I don't think the name was Reichenbach, though. I don't, it was a different name, though. In yeah, New it was Bart, Bartlett, and that's how my dad got his middle name. Oh, wow, what a great story. Um, Excuse so, me. Uh, Chris, did do you, you have a question? We, yeah, did you know that Reese Witherspoon's ancestor, John Witherspoon, wrote the Declaration of Independence? Well, he might have. Thomas Jefferson is the one who gets the credit for writing it, but the, a lot of people gave him ideas. So maybe Reese Witherspoon's ancestor was one of the people who suggested some great ideas. Well, what, what, what she mean, mean he didn't write the Declaration of Independence? It was mostly Thomas Jefferson, but he did take it into consideration the ideas of a lot of the other people who were at the Continental Congress. Yeah, and they all signed it. And they all signed it. That's a good point. And speaking of signing it, John Hancock, who was from Massachusetts, said, I want to be sure that King see, sees my signature. So he wrote it really big. That's why sometimes people say, give me your John Hancock, when they mean, give me your signature, because he just wrote it so big. Um, another thing that I was going to say is after the war, there was still work to be done. We still didn't have much money. We still needed to set up a government. And 
and we needed a peace treaty with England. Even though we had just fought with them, we needed to come to some kind of treaty. We needed to still be able to be civil with them and we needed to trade with them. So John Adams got sent over to England to talk to the king and to, to um, work on a peace treaty. And, and they ultimately did have it. It was called the Treaty of Paris, but it took a few years to pull it together. So he was living over in Europe for a number of years and his wife and a couple of their kids went over there to live with him as well. Um, so that's where he was. Now, when he was home in between, one thing he did is when the colonies, each colony became its own state, each state needed their own state laws. So John Adams is the person who wrote the Massachusetts um, constitution. He's the one who wrote the state laws for Massachusetts. He wasn't around, he was over in Europe when our country wrote the, the, the laws for the whole country, but they used um, the Massachusetts constitution as, a, as an example, because they really thought that um, what Adams had written was made a lot of sense. And as you probably all know, the way our government is set up in Massachusetts and in our country is there are three parts. There's the executive branch, which is the president and his helpers. And then there's the legislature, which are the senators and the representatives. And then there's the judiciary, which are the judges. And they're all supposed to work together to make sure that the government runs so smoothly. The president's not supposed to get too powerful. The Senate and the rep representatives aren't supposed to get too powerful. The judges aren't supposed to get too powerful. They're all supposed to keep each other in check. Um, so, so that was something that, that those ideas go back to John Adams who really wrote them into the Massachusetts law. Um, and after the constitution was written, the federal constitution, and it said, we need a president, we need a Senate, you know, a Congress, we need a judge. Then they had to come up with the idea of who's going to be the first president. And it was unanimous. Everybody said, it's got to be George Washington. He, he led us through this war. He's a great leader. He's a gentle person. Um, he listens to advice. He'll take good advice from a lot of people. He's humble, you know? And so he'd be a good person to have as the first president. And so he became the first president. And then he put his cabinet together. Cabinet was small in those days. There were only four departments. But Fry, who were some of the people in his department? John Adams was his vice president. John Adams was his vice president. Thomas Jefferson was Secretary of State. Thomas Jefferson was Secretary of State. And Alexander Hamilton was Secretary, sec, sec, Secretary of Treasury. Yeah, Alexander Hamilton was Secretary of Treasury. And I think, I don't know, was it John Jay was Attorney General maybe, and Knox was- Henry Knox. Henry Knox was uh, Secretary of Defense, but that no. was it. Secretary of War, it was called something different then. But those, so there were a lot of strong men with a lot of strong opinions um, and they didn't all agree with each other. So it was, they had to figure out how to run a country. So there were a lot of intense conversations and John Adams didn't love being vice president. He thought it was kind of a useless job. He felt like he was just waiting around in case anything ever happened to the president. Um, but, but he, um, but you know, he definitely was one of the voices that had a lot to say as our government got started. And then George Washington, and this is a really important story today. George Washington was president for two terms, four years and four years. So he was president for eight years. And then he said, I'm done. You know, I've, I've served my time and now it's time for another president to, to take over. <clears throat> and other countries said, what? Are you kidding? We have kings and kings serve for a lifetime. We can't believe you're walking away from this. You're walking away from your job. And they said, this is what it means to be a democracy. When you vote for people, you have to change the people. And so there was another election and the person who won the election just barely was John Adams. And it, in those days, this is so funny to believe, I can't even picture it now, but in those days, if you lost the election, <laughs> you became the vice president. So the second president was John Adams, but his vice president, was Thomas Jefferson, who had just barely lost to him. And they'd had, you know, they'd had a little bit of a rough um, campaign, but now they had to work together. And so, so that was kind of interesting. And, and it was hard to follow in George Washington's footsteps because everybody loved him. And he was such a leader. And a lot of people, as I say, thought John Adams was a little arrogant and things like that. Um, so he didn't have an easy road. And when he was in office, he started the Navy. He made an official Navy. And he um, kept us out of war. France was having a revolution and he was able to kind of keep us out of that revolution. 
But the other thing, the big thing is he was the first president to live in the White House. When George Washington became president, they started out in New York City and then they moved into a temporary president's house in Philadelphia and they had plans to build this huge White House, the one that we have now in Washington, DC, um, but it wasn't ready while George Washington was president and it became ready when John Adams was president. So he and Abigail moved in and it was just unfinished. There were all the rooms and it was drafty and it was, you know, plaster on the wall. And she, uh, she didn't want any, but she didn't want to hang her laundry outside so everybody could see the president's underwear. So she hung her um, clotheslines inside the White House. So, but that was, that's what he was famous for. But that was one term. And then John Adams wanted to have another term. And oh, and he did something, he did something bad too while he was president in that a lot of people were critical of him. And this still happens in the newspaper. People, our, our constitution says you can, if you're annoyed, you get to say it, we have freedom of speech. And so there were people who said some really mean things about him. This is my favorite quote. Somebody said, that's okay. Somebody said he's old, querulous, which means he's whiny, um, bald, blind, crippled, and toothless. And so he would get so upset when people would say that about him that he made laws that you could get arrested or you could go to jail if you spoke against the president. Those were called um, sedition acts. And, and so, so that wasn't a great thing. So when he was up for reelection, there were a lot of people who didn't like him, um, but he ran against Thomas Jefferson again. And that election was really, really ugly. Um, and Thomas Jefferson won. And so they said such mean things about each other. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, Brian, honey, I'm doing, I'm hitting it all, honey. Thomas Jefferson said, Mr. Adams is vain and irritable and stubborn. And so they said mean things about, e uh, about each other. And so that really kind of ended their friendship. They'd been friends back in the days when they worked together in the beginning of the, you know, the Continental Congress. But that really put some, some um, harsh, it, it really did a number on their friendship. And so John Adams went back, he retired and he came back up to Braintree and Thomas Jefferson became the third president. And so George Washington had two terms. John Adams only had one term and then Thomas Jefferson went on to have two terms. But John, Brian says I'm forgetting some important things. Slides. So which one? You want me to go back? No, no, no. Forward. Forward? Okay. So we'll come back to this. So when John Adams retired, he came back up to Braintree, but he and Abigail had built this bigger house. And so Brian and I went here the other day, and it's on this big piece of property. And this is also in Quincy um, now. And so when he came back here, you know, they, their daughter Susanna had died when she was a child and their daughter, their son, um, I guess it was Charles had died as a young man of al alcoholism. He had a bad alcoholism problem. And then their daughter Nabby died when she was a pretty young woman. Um, she had breast cancer. And of course they didn't have the medicine to deal with it then. So she died with breast cancer. And then his other son, Thomas, was kind of a bully and was also had some alcohol problems. So he had been a lawyer and a judge, but he came back here to live and was just kind of a hard person to be around. Um, but John Quincy Adams, we'll talk about next week because he went on to do amazing things politically. And they had a lot of grandchildren. They had a lot of grandchildren who came here and worked on the farm. And uh, John Adams went back to his farming roots. He would spend a lot of time outside. He would spend a lot of time farming. And, um, and then uh, uh, he, uh, Abigail died before him. Um, I'm trying to find the, the, the date. But they were here back here for a little while. And then in 1818, she died. And she was nine years younger than he was, as you remember. But she died when she was 74. And so then John Adams was here a lot of years by himself um, and with his grandchildren and children, but he really spent a lot of time writing letters. He just always loved writing letters as we know from all his years writing to Abigail when they were apart. And so now he would write to his old friends from the Revolutionary War and people he'd been in Congress with and they would just spend a lot of time corresponding. And one of his friends, Dr. Rush said, you know, I really think you need to write to Thomas Jefferson. I know you haven't talked in many, many years. I know you got really mad at each other around the time of the 1800 election, but you have a lot in common. You have shared history, you have shared interests. So John Adams um, 
in 1812 on New Year's Day, I, this might have been his New Year's resolution, he wrote to Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson lived in Virginia. He was 500 miles away. But over the next 14 years, they wrote each other 158 really long letters. Um, and they really talked about old memories and they talked about family and they talked about ideas for starting a country. So, so that was something that, that happened in their later years. Next slide. Yeah, next. And so here we have them. This is John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And this is when in one of the books Brian and I were reading was calling them frenemies. They were friends that became <laughs> enemies and still were friends. So they had this renewed correspondence. They wrote to each other. And what is amazing, and, and some people call this the great and miraculous coincidence, but they both lived to be pretty old men. John Adams was eight years older than Thomas Jefferson, um, but they were approaching 1826. 1826 was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, which they both had helped write. And they both lived till July 4th, the exact date of the Declaration of Independence, 50 years later. And John Adams knew that he was dying and he said, oh, Thomas Jefferson survives me. But he didn't know Thomas Jefferson had died a couple of hours earlier back in Virginia. But both Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died on the same day, 50 years, the 50 year anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, which is just a huge coincidence. So what else, Brian? That's it. That's it. I think that's it. But I guess, I guess the big thing that the big takeaway from this is that from George Washington to every, everybody thought he was amazing and who could possibly follow in his footsteps. And then he transferred the power to John Adams. And then John Adams had a terrible fight with Thomas Jefferson and they said terrible things about each other. And it was a nasty, nasty election, but he transferred the power to Thomas Jefferson. And this has happened for 45 presidents. And it's something that in our democracy, we're very proud of. It's called a peaceful transfer of power. And in a democracy, when you lose an election, you peacefully transfer the power to the next president. And so this is kind of important right now because it's the transfer of power that's happening right now is not so peaceful. Um, and so it's this is something that's kind of sad to a lot of people who follow history and politics because they say, no, 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 this is, this is why our country is a democracy. You're supposed to have a peaceful transfer of power and just trust and be honest and, and accepting when somebody else wins. So I think I think we wanted to say that too, right? Yeah. Right? So Karen, I guess you can go back to the gallery if anybody has any questions. Okay, well, wow, that was incredible. That was actually <laughs> sweet. No, it was really, Our, really great. Dan? So Julia and Brian, um, I wrote in the chat, um, I remember saying, I heard, uh, like I wrote in the chat, like, I remember how horrible and treated like people like John Adams. <laughs> um, it's like having, um, well, it's like being mean to people who are uh, different, you know? Well, he was, I will say, Dan, one thing he did like being very smart and he didn't have much patience for people who didn't, who weren't as well read or as well educated as he was. And that, that was unfortunate because there are all kinds of people in a country. And so that was one of his problems. He was a, that last slide that we showed the three presidents, everybody thinks of, um, thinks of George Washington as the father of our country, you know, and, and yeah. the, the commander of the Continental Army. And then people think of Thomas Jefferson as the writer of the Declaration of Independence. And so the yeah. one who really knew all the ideas that we wanted to have in our country. But with John Adams, even though sometimes he was a little not tolerant of other people who weren't as well educated, he had such big ideas. And he really, more than anybody else, he helped form the kind of government that we would have, both in Massachusetts and the country. So he, more than any other president, really gets a lot of credit for really helping to set up the kind of government that we do have. Yeah. Yeah. But he did have, we all have our faults. And uh, yeah, so and, he, and he we was- all have our disagreements. Uh, yeah, we talk. all do. And, yeah. And actually another very public disagreement was since we've mentioned the Secretary of Treasury, 
that Adams and Hamilton had a lot of me wants to say to Arnello and his and Hamilton's yeah during Adams' presidency is what one of the reasons that led to Adams having one term. And I'm glad Brian said that because Brian asked me to play a two minute song for you from the play Hamilton, but it's about John Hancock. And it's, a, I'm sorry, it's about John Adams. And it's when King George III is saying, what, you're gonna go from George Washington to John Adams? How could that possibly be? He's such a you know, ridiculous little man. So um, Karen, could you play that song for us? I sure it's can. It's a minute and 45 seconds, but this is one of Brian's absolute favorite songs. So this is King George. And a little background, he was the ambassador to Great Britain. Yeah. Is it I don't know the, why I'm having so much trouble today? I think I gotta get rid of all right, there's that one's gone. Now this one. Yeah, John Adams had met the king while he was over there. That little man who said hello to me or whatever. 2020 was going to be a fresh start. I was ready for it. It's like there's no time for me. And have I mentioned I'm a teacher now too? It was really easy to. I know the song. George Washington's yielding his power and stepping away. Is that true? I wasn't aware that was something a person could do. I'm perplexed. <laughs> Are they going to keep on replacing whoever's in charge? If so, who's next? next. There's nobody else in their country who looms quite as large. What? John Adams. <laughs> I know him. That can't be. That's that little guy who spoke to me all those years ago. What was it? 85? That poor man, they're going to eat him alive. Oceans rise. Empires fall next to Washington. To pieces, Jesus Christ, it will be fun. Da 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 President John Adams, good luck. One of my favorites too. Love hey, ben. You. hey Ben, do you have a question? Yeah, so I was wondering about the 1812 thing. That is it true that 1812 the British return the favor and burning the White House? That was in the War of 1812. Yeah. Yep. So with that, I thought. John Adams would be man, be man at the time, and and during the 1812, uh, it just popped back in my head like, wait a minute, the the White House was burned. Right, but he was. Time. You're right, but he was back. He was retired by then, living back here in Braintree, Quincy, Massachusetts. Yeah, but you're right, Chris. Yeah. Unbute. There you go. We 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 have good we have good popes, but we haven't had much good presidents as much. Oh, we've had some great ones, don't you think? Yeah, but 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 but, but some of them some of them some of the bad ones should not have won. We only had well, good popes. Well, you know what? That's the thing about a democracy. Sometimes you get really great presidents. Sometimes you get some that aren't quite as good. But at least the people get the choice, the chance to vote for them. And 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 if you don't like somebody, if you don't think they do a good job, then you can vote them out. You're not stuck with them. You get to vote them out. Well, well, well right. what, I just right. want the world to be in the right hands. I just want the world to be in the right hands. So do I. Amen, brother. Like Jimmy Carter did. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Like Donald Trump 
going out here in two weeks. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're just what? quietly jumping in our Who's this by? inside. <laughs> Elizabeth, do you have a question or a comment? I got a little comment for you. Oh, like, great. I was doing a school project um, during middle school. We did a play based on the big, on the um, Boston Tea Party. Mm -hmm. the, the, the role of John Adams. You played the role of John Adams? Yeah. Oh my goodness, so, so you must have been familiar with a lot of the things Brian and I were talking about. Yep. Great, oh cool. I love that you played John Adams. When I was in elementary school, I played King George. I love that. I love when oh. you played the man. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Thanks, oh. Elizabeth. Is that Dan? One more? Or, oh no, Durkin. I'm sorry, Brendan, you haven't had a chance yet. Yeah, hey guys. Hey, Durkin. Hi, Hi Brendan. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Happy New Year. Hey, too. Great. We're doing good. Uh, of some sort, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I want to know not more about John Adams, but I really want to know, like, how they really come in, like, the two of them, you know, like, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, which I really want to know. But my other question is, um, I, I, I exactly know, I went on a trip once with my folks, my, my mom and dad, about the burial grounds where he, John Adams, was to die and dead. But um, it was somewhere in the catacombs, but it was next, it was next to his son, John Quincy Adams Jr. What a good memory. He's buried, you're right, and under the ground, sort of like catacombs, and I think it's First Parish Church in Quincy. So he's yeah. definitely, and he's buried next to his son. You're absolutely right. And then the other thing about his friendship with Thomas Jefferson, one thing we didn't say is that time when he was over in France and he was over in Europe for so many time, for so many years, and his wife came over and his kids. Well, Thomas Jefferson was over there with one of his daughters. And during those years, they became very close. That's before they had their presidential election campaign fight, but they did become very close living in Europe, right? Close to each other and doing so many social things together. I don't like that really, because I wasn't, I wasn't really sure about the time when Adams Lincoln, um, like, all those presidency that we know, but I think I'm trying to really, really understand this from being late, which is fine. I just want to know a one quick thing. Um, all the presidents that Brian said, um, it's a question for you, Brian. Um, when I think of those three, three, let's just hope, um, plans, what you said, I really wasn't sure about what Adam's role was until he got his job. Yeah, and it's, you know what's funny too, Brendan, I was gonna say this before and you just reminded me. I mean, we all know his name and we all know that he was an important part, but when you go down to DC, Brian and I just read this yesterday. When you go down to Washington, DC, there's a statue for Washington and there's a statue for Thomas Jefferson. And even that a, and even that a Hamilton. Yep, Hamilton, but there's not a statue of Adam. Uh, Hamilton, so, hey, yeah. hey, Brian, I have the album. Yep. Uh -huh. so he has this funny place in history. We all know him and he did great things, but also he had, you know, as I say, he tried to suppress journalists who criticized him and he was a little cranky. Yeah. <laughs> and what, you have an album. Well, I hate to be cranky, but someone just reminded me that it's after three. Oh, sorry, uh, That's OK. 